Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. There are a few things that we look at the statistics and can notice is that you are really interested in the low level hacking stuff. Uh, if I look at what you watch the most, that is one thing. And we also had a poll rather recently asking you which sort of topic you would like to see more of and uh, quite a few were actually quite content with the mix we have today but if there was one platform that people suggested we have more material for it was the Amiga. So to be honest this will be one of my own personal favorite episodes that we will see now. This will be Galahad showing us how to crack games on the Amiga. I've been trying to do that, but I didn't really catch it didn't really catch on. I never really got it because the ways on how to do it on the Amiga is a bit different than on the C64. So I'm not saying that in two hours you will be the most uh, prominent Amiga crackers of all times, but at least you have seen a good solid run through of how it could be done on the Amiga. Over to Galland. Howdy again! And this will be one of your favorite episodes because I have done polls telling that you want a more cracking material and you want two more Amiga material. And looking at the history, the most popular episodes we've had was the interview with Phil Galahad. So Phil is back to tell us how to crack cracks, crack games on the Amiga. Hello, Phil. Hello, how are you doing? All super nice. I'm, I'm really excited about this. I mean, this is also one of my favorites because I have tried cracking on the Amiga and I never really made it. So I'm actually very, very anxious to see this as well. So I'm, I'm sort of having a, 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 a viewing spot very, very close to the action. And I'm all excited about that. Well, yeah, you're probably slightly more excited than I than I am, but uh, yeah, I mean, for 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 the for the the the, the people viewing out there, I'm I'm sure it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see um, how it, how it might have been done back in the day. Yes, yes. So, um, I mean, before we start doing this, and this will be done on on an emulator, and uh, because that is sort of the easy way to do it as well today. So, but. Back in the days when you got an original, did you get the actual physical box and the original disc, or did you get somebody uh, like reading the disc off the original somewhere and sending it to you via modem? Uh, no. Uh, well, before I kind of actually joined what I'd consider worthy groups where I'd actually had a chance of, you know, cracking a title at the same time as everybody else in being part of the race to get uh, a title released. Yeah. Um, yes, I would have had access to the originals in a box in my hand. But when you've kind of on the modem scene, you don't have any of that um, because the speed of the Amiga scene is such that you don't have time to wait for someone to send you the discs in the post. By the time... By the time you've received them in the post, the, the, the race is, is long won. Somebody else is cheering how awesome they are, and they're already moving on to the next title. So unless you were to get a, a game um, ahead of time, and even then, even then, when I, when I was in Fairlight, um, I remember we had Manchester United Premier League champions. We got that early. There was there was no risk in sending discs in the post where they might have got lost. It was you, you you would speak to the original supply, you would try and identify what the protection was, and you would get it over to you on the modem because that is the quickest way of doing it. So yeah, back before I was on the modem scene to kind of learn my craft, yes, yeah, you you know, if you you nine times out of ten you had a boxed original to work from, which is which is a lot easier than having to deal with warp files over mm. 
because you've got the physical disc and you know it's going to work. But um, you, you almost kind of have to relearn cracking all over again when you join a modem scene because now you're presented with a load of new problems that you didn't have when you had access mm. to the discs. So, um, yeah, so my time in Scupex and Fairlight and Dual Crew Shining, so I never had access to the discs. Mm. It was all over the modem. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So, and the warp files, did they actually, like, work? So if you wrote them out to disk, would they work as an original, or did you have to kind of bypass the fact that it actually didn't work from a copy? It all depended on the protection. Um, there were some MFM format schemes that the warpers knew the details of, and they were actually able to read them and write them out perfectly. Yeah. Um, there was also um, a piece of uh, hardware and it was it was actually for Mac emulation. It was called Sybil, um, and you could use that in conjunction with Phil Douglas Warp. Phil Douglas was a, a big cracker, very, mm. very, very, very capable guy on the Amiga, um, and I think he discovered that he could slow the Amiga um, disk drive down by using this Sybil hardware, which was to do with Mac emulation on the Amiga. Yeah. Um, and then he was able to actually write the originals out onto a floppy disk, no matter how how large the MFM format was. But nine times out of ten, um, if you correctly identified the format of the disk um, before the original supplier used a warper, it was yeah. it was quite common where software companies would reuse the same. Um, disk system over yeah. and over again, like Gremlin Interactive were notorious for using a specific MFM format. Um, Team Seventeen, Probe Software, they were they were known for using Rob Northern's PDOS. So instead of you know using a warper on those kind of discs, once you identified what they were, we had um, pre written readers. Mm. where we could actually, from the original supplier's end, decode and read the entire disk into memory, yeah. save it out as a file. Yeah. He would then compress it with LHA, yeah. send it over to us on a modem, go through the next disk and the next disk until they were all done. Yeah. Um, and obviously the bonus is, is the file is smaller because it knows the format and it's only reading the data it needs to read. Yeah. which means you don't have like a, a two to three megabyte file. You've got maybe a one megabyte file, so you get it faster. And also the data has been decoded off the disk. So you've got all the plain data off the disk. And now it's just a case of, right, I know how this format works. Can I fit it on a disk? No, there's extra. Let's put it on another disk. Yeah. Um, so it all depended on the disk, all depended on the developer, Certain developers use their own system time and time again, probably more for convenience more than anything else, but that also ended up being convenient for us because an ARC developments game, you could have that read on the, the original supplier's computer. It would um, crack it to DOS. It would spit all the files out onto a, onto a, onto a disk. He would then use DMS, which was like a, a, a disk archiver to just DMS a disk up send it over to us and then you would then find where you need to put the loader if there was copy lock in there you would then uh, see if you needed any other information off the the original disk to get the serial key nine mm -hmm. times out of ten you didn't because it it was stupidly coded in the game um and then before you know it literally from the original supplier calling to say i've got this original mm -hmm. especially an arc developments game by the time it was in your hands, which could at least be, I'll just say, like, for instance, a one-disc game like R-Type 2, um, that could be broken to DOS within about five minutes, and then it would take maybe 15, 20 minutes to send, depending on how fast your modem was, and then you'd have the files on the disk, you'd patch the loader in, you'd remove the copy lock, you'd turn, uh, have an executable to kick it all off, yeah. Chuck on a a, a crack tray, and literally within two hours, you, you could be done because you've already built a reader that knows that format and can read it all in, and you know you're not gonna 
miss any data and you're not going to be caught out by anything so i i would always try and identify the gate the, the protection first because i didn't really want to wait you know 40 minutes for a a, a, a warp file to come across to me when mm -hmm. a reader might well have solved that problem for me yeah, so the, the the trick here is how to remote access or remote control your supplier. He he doesn't always he is <laughs> he needs to be uh, uh, um, having access to the stuff, but he also need to be capable enough to kind of understand it, the basic instruction yeah. on how to rip the disk. Please do like it's, this. It's this exactly and this. that. I mean, a lot of the original supplies uh, they were basically. Um, I'm not going to say they're idiots, but they were they were games players head of everything else and you had to kind of break it down to explain to them exactly what you wanted and how you wanted it done but i gotta say hogster of fairlight who was the main supplier when i was in fairlight when i when i joined at the start of um or well, the end of 93 stroke 94 um he was he was he was really good because obviously he would have a collection of my utilities already and straight away, he'd be there, sat there going, right, what do you want me to do? And he'd be like, right, copy lock check, yep. copy lock check. There's no copy lock on that one. Right, stick it through X copy. Let's yep. see what we're dealing with. But it's all green zeros. Right, DMS the disk, yep. send it to me as soon as it's DMS. If all of a sudden it was like a green zero for the boot block and then red zeros the rest, right, we're dealing with an MFM format. We don't know what it is. Mm. DMS the boot block to me. And then I'll be back in touch with you once I've identified what it is. And I either send him a reader so that he can image the entire disk. Or it's like, no, I've not seen this one before. Get the warper on it, warp the disk, and then send it over to me once uh, once it's, it's done. Um, I, I guess the scary part is as well here that uh, you would need to provide the supplier with a number of tools. So if that supplier yes. leaves, uh, you're also sort of... Uh, he sits there with all your tools. Uh, it's quite possible that a lot of my tools are out there in the world, and I don't know anything about it. But yeah. it's that's just the this just the the nature of of um, of, of software that's that's free and perceived as useful. Um, I remember they um, having hold of some Cortex um, Rob Northern tools that for certain Rob Northern protected games. Uh, specifically the ones where they encrypted the boot block and that, they, they wrote a utility that would basically automate the cracking process on that particular, mm. those particular games. Um, all the warpers that were out there, there was there was Nomad Warp, there was Phil Douglas Warp, there was Ferox Warp, there was, well, there was loads of different warpers by lots of different crackers. And obviously at one time they were internal tools for a specific group, but they end up getting leaked to everybody, yeah. um, and everybody ends up using it. I mean, I I actually had the the same civil hardware that um, Phil Douglas had, although by the time I joined the scene, uh, the the amount of discs that would re would have required something like Sybil was actually fairly um, fairly small. Obviously, Phil Douglas was um, on the Amiga scene you know, throughout the, the major, major, major releases. Mm. Um, but I was still able to get a hold of his warper so I could have used it if I wanted to. You know, I said, oh, I've got that civil hardware. Oh, do you want Phil Douglas's warper for that? Then that'll, <laughs> you can use it and then you can write out long track discs. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh. Right, thanks very much. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't really bother me that whether or not any of my tools got out um, because... In all honesty, a lot of the tools that I wrote, they weren't that complicated. Anyone with a with a degree of um, thinking behind them could write them. It's just whether or not you bother to put the the time in to do it. And mm. I was writing all this, all these tools and stuff before I joined the modem scene. I I think I was kind of hoping and dreaming that at some point I would eventually get on the scene, and all this crap was going to be useful mm. to help make me a better cracker a faster cracker and give me an edge over crackers in other groups that were potentially going to be getting the game at the same time um so it's uh yeah it's quite possible my tools are out there i've not seen it or no one's ever said yeah. 
Oh, I've got a, I've got a, an, an ADF of all your tools and that, but um, yeah, I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 same situation on the C64 where we had uh, the original supplier having tape transfers transferring all the stuff to disk and then sending it over uh, via modem. So the, the process is exactly the same. It's just uh, some tool in the far end that automates the process so that it could be sent over to somebody who can do the actual packaging. Yeah, it's, uh, it, doesn't sound, it doesn't sound very different. It's just slightly different ways of, 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 um, of doing stuff. Obviously, yeah. it's taping on the Commodore 64 floppy disk on the Amiga, and then we get onto consoles and it's CD, and then it goes on to DVD, and, mm -hmm. you know, it constantly evolves. Um, uh, what well, they're on Blu-ray now, massive Blu-rays. Um, you imagine a poor modem trader back in back in the 80s trying to transfer a Blu-ray. <laughs> oh, extracting stuff from Steam. So you need to have your account uh, and then download the stuff from steam and uh yeah remove the checks for steam um adding the some sort of supplied by steam do you reckon they'd be happy with yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the thing is um uh, also because they're tracking your ip address so um yeah on the on the pc i know that uh, some of the guys they they well they went to have a burger at uh, at mcdonald's so they used the free wi-fi at mcdonald's or bicycle away a few kilometers to somebody who had like a, a f open wi-fi back home so uh, downloading that little extra file that they needed off steam um yeah so it's uh, it, it's been done in many different ways but we won't talk about cracking pc stuff or console stuff now we're getting to amiga phil fire up that amiga screen now and fire along right let's um Right, I need to um need to share this. Where's the oh there it is. Share screen. And we are super competent with old computers. New <clears throat> not so much. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> right, so it his um his um uh Win UAE Amiga emulator. Um this is uh an A twelve hundred emulation um, with a hard drive um that's not particularly important um, um other than just to show um that, that the tools that might have potentially been used so that we can um show it from the original suppliers and what he might have done um so obviously uh we got speedball 2 the original suppliers got it and first thing we want to do is we want to we want to identify what's on the disk being the, that it's the Bitmap Brothers, and with the exception of their very first game, which was Zenon, where they did their own disk system and protection, or it might have been written by Rob Northern, because I know he had a few. He kind of... Um, he started off doing protection on the Amiga, and you can kind of see the genesis of where copy lock eventually came from and so i suspect that what zenon had was an early protection by rob northern um and they seem to have stuck with him for every single release that they did um so as a cracker i'd be fairly confident that the the game that i'm going to be supplied by the original supplier a bitmap brothers game is going to be a copy lock but mm -hmm. we're not going to guess so do you have anything connected? I mean, uh, I mean, logically connected. Is there like an action replay here uh, connected to this emulator uh, machine? Not, or? There will be. There will be on the cracking Amiga, but this is this is ass assuming that this is the uh, uh, Amiga setup that the the original suppliers got. Yeah. So he doesn't need an action replay. I'll tell you what, though, if the original supplier did have an action replay, you, you'd have, by the time you'd finished with the poor bugger, he'd have known just as much cracking ability as me because it would have been like, right, break point here, do this, do that, right, uh, give me that number there, and you could have cracked the game remotely by getting him to do all the work. Uh, um, so, yeah, one of the utilities that I uh, that he'd have had is copy lock check, and it's nothing particularly um, exciting. It's basically checks just to see whether or not there's actually a copy lock track on the disk. So we're now going to put the drive in, uh, the disk in. Right, and then we press left mouse button, it checks. 
Well, that's 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 weird. Have I got the right disc? I don't think I've got the right disc here. <laughs> that's 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 your that's crack. That's super useful, that is, isn't it? Oh, I know why. It's because I've probably got the disc speed. Yeah, that's why. Idiot. Right, so let's try that again. So, so he would boot up the copyright check utility. He'd put the disc in. Multitasking's halted because um, the Amiga doesn't like you swapping to non-DOS discs and stuff. Left mouse button. And there we go. If you look on the screen now, it says copy lock trap detected on disk. And that's the end of the check. So now we know that there's definitely a copy lock on there. Um, so we know what we're up against. What we'd also do is we'd... Um, I go to this. Oh, bear with me one second. Has it come back? No, it hasn't. Nope. Bear with me. Now we're getting it. Yeah, we go. Right. So this yes. is the the, 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 cracker, the cracker computer. It would be a one point three or a one point two A five hundred, um, which is what I would have used back in the day. I actually I used a Kickstart one point two machine. Mine was mine was quite an early one. Um, Did you have the uh, action replay also for the A twelve hundred, or you just had it? No, for... never, 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 never needed it because. By then, my skills had got to the point where I didn't need an action replay to crack anymore. Oh. Um, and there was uh, Blackhawk um, ripped action replay three and rejigged it so that it would work as a resident program in memory on an A1200. Oh. So if you were really desperate for something to poke around and see what was going on, then that was it wasn't the worst thing in the world. Um, obviously, as long as nothing overwrote it. Um, I know that Detel did an action replay, uh, which was based on a software version called HRT Mon, um, and that was quite expensive, from what I recall. But the the port the, 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 on the A five hundred, the action replay sat on the side in the expansion port. Yeah. Um, but on the A twelve hundred, it actually sat in the trapdoor slot underneath the machine, which meant that if you had a RAM card you had a processor card in there well you couldn't have it mm. um so you were uh, you were stuck between one or the other so i never i never even bothered with it in all honesty um if i could do it on the a500 i would do it on the a500 um or it was doing it on the a1200 um using um genam using whatever tools there were i mean you know as long as you can get access to the data i mean the, the MFM format hasn't changed. The, the, the same disk systems work. Um, they're using the same packers to pack the files and that. So as long as you can still get to the data, unpack the data, examine the code and what have you, mm -hmm. didn't need to do anything on the A1200. I mean, I I don't think any, any specific KGA game, I'm fairly sure I didn't use the A1200 specific. I think I did it all on the A500. Mm. Um, and what I would use, I would use, I wouldn't use, obviously you can't, if it's a two make chip RAM game on an A1200, you can't load it up on a 512k chip RAM A500. Mm. But what I would use the action replay as would just be as almost like a, a, a RAM resident utility disc. Mm. Um, instead of having to have a f physical floppy disc and run stuff off the hard drive, you knew that you could just press a button and every utility that you could ever need was there mm -hmm. and you could just do it on the A500. You wouldn't physically be able to use the, the action replay to go stepping through code or anything because mm -hmm. obviously you couldn't run the game on your A500 unless it was a much later one that had been hacked to use 2 mega chip RAM. But then I think there was problems with later kickstarts with the action replay mm -hmm. 3, so you couldn't even use it anyway. Um but anyway, um, going back to this, we now know that Speedball 2 has got a copy lock on it. Mm -hmm. But now what we need to do is we now need to examine the examine the disk. Um, so whatever he's got at his end, whether it be XCopy, Burst Nibbler, it's, it's irrelevant what copy program he uses, but he just needs to use a standard DOS copy 
and he just needs to chuck it in there. And, and the reason why we do this is we want to see whether or not the disk format is all green. If it's all green, it means yeah. it's an Amiga DOS formatted disk. It's standard. There's nothing complicated about the data on there. We can image the disk and get the data, and it's fine. Mm. If it all turns in that it's um, it's um, red on all the tracks, then it means it's got a custom format, and we've got to tackle it a different way. So rather than him waste time imaging the boot block and sending it to me and then seeing if I need to do a reader or he needs to walk the disk, let's first identify whether or not the disk can be copied. And there we go. We've got all green. And you can see at the bottom there, we've got an, an orange orange marker. That's the copy lot track. But it's reading the, the Speedball 2 original disk. And as you can see, it's all green. So this is a typical Bitmap Brothers um, disk layout, where it's a normal Amiga sector loading uh, Amiga DOS disk with a copy lock track. And there doesn't appear to be any, we're now over halfway through the disk. And there doesn't appear to be anything shocking. And we can speed this up with Win, Win UAE. And done. Yep. So now that we know that that's what we're dealing with, what I would be saying to the um, the uh, original supplier is 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 simply this: is right, image the disk with Disk Master, skip any errors, and then send me the, the resultant file. Um, and then he would do that, and then he would modem that up to me. And so basically, I've got ninety nine point nine nine percent of the data I need. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I don't have is the copy lock data. Now, ordinarily. You don't need the copy lock data, depending on how the copy lock's been implemented. Rob Northern did, oh, I'd, I'd hate to say, is it? There's at least four or five different copy locks. I mean, one copy lock would just give a basic serial key result in a data register. Another one would not give any serial key result in any data registers, but it might write it to a specific memory address. Mm -hmm. Another type wouldn't write anything to a, to that a serial key to anywhere, not to a data register, not to a memory address, but what it would do is it would physically modify certain addresses within the game to fix them. Otherwise the game would crash or not operate correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was a couple of there was a couple of other variants as well, where it might modify words or it might build a table, all sorts of stuff. But in reality, we don't need to know what's what the, what goes on inside the copy lock because there is always a method of finding out what it does after it's done its thing. Right. So the, the original supplier has identified that it's all greens, and he's uh, he's sent it up to me and so um we'd reset that well let's put uh, disk sound on i'm going to put disk sound on for a very specific reason and we'll see whether or not uh the kids at home could spot the protection check uh sound. Mean, there might be a click well, it, and, oh, that's the thing. The, the really, the really early copy locks were just—they were something else. It was like a volcano going off, basically, in the floppy drive. <laughs> and you're sat there going, "I wonder if that was the protection check." It, when you when you have a protection check described to you, and you hear the noise that early copy locks make, you're like, "Yeah, that's a protection check. That's what they're supposed to sound like." Right. So, and reset that. Start again. So we've got floppy sound. I can't hear that at all. Hang on a sec. Let's whack that. Uh, we've got that up. We've got that up. We've got that. That's all enabled. Oh, now we lost it. Oh, so okay. We yeah. don't see the entire uh, setting screen. We just see like a lower left half of it. So now we see all of it. Good. No, where's it gone?
Ah, uh, now. Okay, sound. This is the specific. Uh, Phil, we, we need to let it uh, do its thing because it's it's uh, overpowering all of us. <laughs> the power of me? Uh... <laughs> It works for sure. Well, this it hasn't done a protection check yet, so the Bitmap Brothers always let you see their intro. And then the extra round because it's detected that you've got it to load the whole game in one go. Let's see if we can spot the protection check. <laughs> I guess that was it, right? Yeah, that was that just was before it. the menu. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. It really is, and there's, there's there's nothing subtle about it. So, I mean, on the majority, I would say ninety nine percent of any games that have got a Rob Northern copy lock, mm. it's got his name written in the boot block. Mm -hmm. It'll say something like copyright 1990 to 1992 Rob Northern Computes Limited. And no, no obnoxious message it, or anything no, like no, that. No, no, he never he, ne he never did he never did have a have a pop at us, which was probably to his credit because we would have just we would have just gone at him a lot harder. But my brothers, this is the boot block. It's all about them and a serial number for the disc. I see the serial number. It's Amiga 87654312. You know, unfortunately, they haven't left that, 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 the right copy lock key in there. Um, usually, in that boot block, it would say Rob Northern Computing. So you would know automatically that it's copy lock. Mm. But obviously, the Bitmap Brothers, they do their own boot block. Mm. So it's got all their nonsense in there. But because they've always used copy lock, Zenon 2, Cadaver, um, the Chaos Engine, Magic Pockets, all of them, they've used copy lock. So they've got no real way of, of, of disguising the, the copy lock check. Now, I, it, 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 it makes me wonder what, what brain power is at work at the other end, where they try and disguise the fact it's got a copy lock, but... It so obviously has one when you hear it go off. Mm. And I've only ever heard sensible software of the only ones I know who have ever tried to disguise the copy lock sound. Now, the reason why the copy lock makes so much noise is because the copy lock track is on track zero. So if they've laid their disc out in a logical manner and it's going through the disc, and it's getting towards the end of the disc, going up to like track 60, track 70 to load information. What it then does is it steps down to track zero, reads the track, and then the copy lock will then return the, the floppy heads back to the last position yeah. before it was called. So you, that, you hear those two gr grinding noises. The first grinding noise is the step down, and the second grinding noise is it stepping back up again. Basically um, doing like 70 steps down and then 70 yeah, steps exactly. up. Yeah, exactly. So obviously the more steps that it does, the more obvious it is. Well, what Sensible Software did on, I think it was Megalomania, is they, they must have figured out when they were doing the disc saying, good God, it's so obvious that it's got a copy lock. Um, so what they did is they would have their files in different positions on the disk, but they wouldn't necessarily read them in a logical order, mm. as in ascending up the disk. What they would do is say, right, just before the copy lock gets called, let's um, load up the next file from lower down the disk 
nearer to track zero. So when we do the copy lock check, it's only got to step one or two tracks down and then back up. And then maybe the crackers may not hear it. They may not notice it. But obviously, they did nothing to disguise the copy lock in memory, which has got the exact same header oh. as every copy lock since 1990. And so all their tricks to disguise the fact the copy lock was there, they had a different boot block. Oh. They did a small step. But when you search for a certain string in memory, ah, Rob Northern copy lock, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, um, but at least it was an attempt. I mean, that is just ridiculous. I mean, you don't even have to be um, a particularly, um, I know, Amiga savvy to go, well, that sounded weird. What was that, I wonder? Um, so, yeah, we, we know it's copy lock. We know what we're dealing with. And so let's just show you. And this is read track from uh, track zero, sector one, into memory address 8400. No, 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 no. But this is this is what, what this is on screen. Is hang on a second. Let me just cancel that off. This is me using the action replay. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. But you are the reading it block. in. Just yeah, so as... basically, it reads um, start from track zero. Read one track. Oh, read okay. it, press eight four zero zero. Um, on action replay, you don't have to put um, a dollar sign in front. It assumes yep. that you you want it in hex, um, whereas HR team on. Uh, assumes the complete opposite and it's quite irritating to use mm. um it's just it's just a memory address i'm used to using for whatever reason there's no rhyme or reason to it i could read it lower i could read it higher but uh, i'm used to reading it to that address so um yeah that's that's what the boot block looks like but now if i do this if i uh reset and i'll i'll speed through this load process <laughs> Right, so now the obviously the the the, the Bitmap Brothers um, intro has started. So if I just do this, and there we go. So what I'm doing FS is find string, yep. and then obviously we've got quote marks, and we're looking for the string ONZ. ONZ is in the header of every single copy lock. And that is the copy lock there. Uh, I think that's 1502C. No, it's not. It's 1506C. That's the copy lock there. And you can see the string along the first line in the center is ONZ. I think it's, I think that's the representation of an illegal instruction or something. Um, the illegal instruction is not used very much on the Amiga. But Rob Northern decided that he was going to use it for every single copy lock. And so you can always find the copy lock once it's in memory. Well, um, it, it makes sense because uh, then you would have debuggers and, and machine code monitors being unable to disassemble it. So Yeah. So that's the header of the, the copy lock there. Uh, the illegal there. That's what you have there. Yeah. And this, if you look from, from address 1509E, this is where it's copies its copy lock code onto whatever the stack um, number is. And so the stack number is currently 7FFEA. It's along the bottom far right. That's A7 is the stack on the Amiga. Well, the 68,000, I should say. Um, and it will write it backwards on the stack, knowing that that memory is free and that it can't conflict with anything. And then it will execute and then it will do the trace vector decoder to decode, um, execute, and re-encode, and, and step through. To step through it, it takes quite a while. But uh, because we know what copy lock does, we don't really even need to know what's going on inside. We just need to make sure that what copy lock does to the game, we emulate mm -hmm. so that um, the copy lock isn't needed anymore. Um, so... We've identified that it's got a copy lock track. We've identified that it's got a um, a copy lock in it. It's not fake. Um, we heard the copy lock check. Um, that would take a little bit longer. If that copy lock track wasn't there, it would take a little bit longer. And if you had another floppy drive attached to your Amiga, it would also search that drive for the copy lock track as well. Mm -hmm. If you had three external drives, 
it would search through all of them to see if it could find them. So you could appreciate that could add 30 seconds onto loading the game just while it tries to find a copyright track that isn't there. Um, and that was kind of the irritating thing about how some crackers would tackle copy lock. Some would let the copy lock run and then modify the routines at the end. Others would write over the header and then skip past the copy lock. Others would decode the copy lock, write the, have the serial key written to a, a, a register and then re-encrypt it. So it would physically run through about 40% of the copy lock minus the disk read routines and usually would give the correct results at the end. But, um, I mean, Rob, Rob Northern did a, uh, an interview with a guy called Co-Tapper, and he said that he didn't um, he didn't concern himself what uh, Crackers on the Amiga and ST were doing with his protection. But I don't believe him, because he kept adding stuff to the copy lock mm. as if he knew how Crackers were beating the copy lock. Mm. I mean, it got to the stage where... Crackers had figured out how they could decode the copy lock. They could modify the code within the copy lock, re-encode it back again, and the copy lock would run, not touch the disk routines, um, and then produce all the correct results and deprotect the game. Um, and, and that would be that. Then spooky, soon after that happened, copy lock, some of the copy locks got some extra code in them specifically in the disk routines that were being skipped, which would set variables in the game that um, would basically be skipped by the, the, the decode method of cracking a copy lock. Um, so how did he, how did he know? How, how did he know to add stuff to the disk read routines without thinking or knowing they're, they're decoding the copy lock and they're, skipping the disc routines and the copy locks given the correct results and the game's being cracked like in seconds um i'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure he downloaded uh or obtained a, a copy and validated how they defeated it and then yeah, evolved that. I mean, over if, that if i was in if i was in the copy protection business yeah. Yeah. and i wanted to see whether or not my efforts were successful in forcing anyone the very first thing I would do is go and download a crack or ask someone who I knew was a bit of a, a ruffian and could get hold of crack copies. All right, when this game gets uh, released, give me as many versions as you can get your hands on. I want to see how they did it. Because okay. I know that Richard Applin, who did the protection on Double Dragon 2, I know he sought out crack copies because he put a lot of effort in mm. i know that dave jones at dma design when lemmings got cracked he sought out a copy to see how how they done it um because that's what you do because you either think well there's there's no point it don't make difference what i do they can defeat me or you think right i need to do this to trip them up i need to do this to thwart them um so I don't believe that he didn't pay any attention to what was going on on the Amiga and STC, and I'm I'm fairly confident he knew exactly what was going on. Well, you need to why... you need to protect protect your investment here, and uh, I mean, if you have a number of companies buying your stuff, and and uh, they are keep they keep using an obsoleted uh, solution, then eventually they will not buy your stuff anymore. So you need to keep up with the competition, otherwise uh, somebody will you... buy something else. I don't know you say that, but I think a lot of the, the, the UK software companies, I think they were they were of the opinion that copyright was reliable. I yeah Billy in um uh at school wasn't gonna be able to crack it and couldn't copy it for his friends. Yeah. I think they were already kind of um of the opinion that trying to stop the, the pro crackers was was a waste of time they were gonna they were gonna mm. defeat it no matter what because it's almost like they, they like we've got other protections so we might as well stick this on it it'll stop the casual copies but the pro crackers they're gonna we don't make difference what we put on there mm. but it's 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 strange even with copy lock and pdos which is rob northern's mfm format it is possible to create a protection 
that is difficult to break mm. because Ocean Software uh, used them both on Jurassic Park. Now, I happen to know that one of the guys in the team on Jurassic Park was an ex-cracker for a group called Crystal, and he went to town on that one, absolute went to town. But he demonstrated that even with protection schemes that were known, it was possible to trip crackers up mm. because they just think, oh, it's just copy lock. Oh, it's it's just PDOS. That'll be easy. Mm. And uh, lots of lots and lots of neat tricks in there. Mm. Um, so I don't know. But my, my belief in, in copy protection is it, it has to be as much part of the as the music and the graphics. Um, it can never be. Um, uh, it can never be. That'll do. And also not being bluntly obvious uh, if it tripped or not. You sneak it in, and eventually mm. on level two things go south. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that the Bitmap Brothers didn't do that with Speedball Two. Speedball Two, when it fails, it's um, it's kind of obvious that it's failed. Um, mm. it, it crashes the Amiga, which is <laughs> fine, but it, from a cracker's point of view you're not remotely going to be convinced that you've cracked it. I mean, what what do they expect? That a cracker was going to not even play test at a match to make sure that they got yeah. it right? That's just mad. Yeah. It doesn't even do a match. It, it crashes straight away. And mm. and then if you remove that check, it's it's worse elsewhere. And there's a there's a piece of text that's modified. Um, they did it. They, well, I, I say that, though, but they did it on gods where... You, I think you couldn't pick up extra lives, and the bad guys were a lot harder to hit, kill. And I think it would eventually crash on World Two, but a lot of people just thought it was a typically really hard bit. My brother's game, and thought, God, this game sucks. It's so hard. my favorite. good. My favorite on the sixty four is is uh, alternate reality. The city, if if it tricks or trips the, the protection, uh, when you go into hotels to sleep for the night, you're not being restored. So you can only survive for a few days. Um, even if you're super good at the actual game, there is no way you will survive over two or three days. Well, that's good because that's the kind of thing that will slip through. Yeah. Um, and, you know, three days later, someone goes, yeah, there's something not right with this game. And then... It means that the crackers then got to play a game that they're potentially they're not very good at. Yeah. Um, that's, um, I mean, you know, cracking a shoot 'em up is generally quite easy because they're structured in a certain way and you can skip levels and what have you. But adventure games and stuff like that, where you've you can't skip levels and it's all written in C and and or some scripted language in that, that uh, that can take a lot longer to do, hell of a lot longer. Um, yeah, so and, and what can also happen is that somebody released a game and, and it looks all perfect. And, and when you play it through, <clears throat> there is nothing obvious that it actually doesn't work fully. So nobody yeah. else bothers. And then the game, the only version that actually up out there is actually faulty. So the only yeah. way if you want to play the real experience that actually works, you need to buy the original. Because uh, when people find out uh, the game is so old, so the crackers never bother to revisit it. Yeah, that, but I would say that is the one. That is the one failure of the Amiga scene. Is it was the the um, the scramble to be first, to be quickest, yeah. um, and that didn't lend itself to necessarily putting your best work out there. Sometimes you're like, oh, I. I really want to play test this for another half an hour, but you've got an original supply of Brian Danny Neck. You've got um, you've got uh, uh, traders itching to you know get it spread and that, and you're like, oh, how long do I spend on a game? Um, and it's there's nothing worse than having doubts in the back of your mind, and it gets released, and then someone goes, oh yeah, I found a problem. You're like, oh, all I needed was half an hour, yeah. but. That's the problem. I mean, it, it amazes me sometimes just how much of the Amiga stuff we got right. Um, and it usually, I would say, it was the um, it was some of the simpler protected stuff that is what caught people out. Um, it's when people went over the top on the protection and really, really went for it. Yeah. That you were kind of um, you, you kind of made sure that you weren't going to get caught out by it and you made more of an effort i think because they'd gone to town but something subtle could 
could slip through that some programmer just I'll oh, just stick that in there as an afterthought mm -hmm. and it catches everybody out. It's it's mad how it happens. It really is. Um, but yeah, it, the, the fact of the matter is, is if we didn't have speed to kind of push us on, well, then we would never have been first on the releases, which is what it was all about. So yeah. it's a double it's a double edged sword, really. But um, I I am happy that you know when you look back on the Amiga scene. Um, I would say the majority of the stuff that got released was done properly. Mm. Um, a few, a few really good titles didn't get done properly, but for the most part, most most of the quality stuff got done properly. Um, but uh, yeah, history now, eh? Yeah, well, and and the other good thing is that uh, now you can do it properly. Uh, some thirty years after, or twenty five years after, uh, there is revisiting the opportunity to revisit and visit and do things properly yeah well yeah I, i've done a lot of um tracks of stuff that wasn't done back in the day properly um but then of course i've got all the time in the world now i don't have to worry about competing against um anybody else yeah uh, I don't, you know it's like there's a game i did called gateway ypsilon let's go back must be a year now and I took my time over that one because the guy had really, really wanted, he didn't do doing it cracked. He really went to town on it. And I spent weeks on it, just like doing it when I had downtime. There's no competition from anyone. No one's trying to beat me. No one's, no one's having a go at the same time. It's just kind of slipped through the nets. And I'm like, I'll just do it when I get it done yeah. because this guy's really gone to town on the protection and I don't want to get caught out by him because I haven't got the excuse of, oh, I, I had to release it because Billy was going to release it. It's a case of, <laughs> it's no one else releasing it. So yeah. do it right first time and that'll be it then. Um, but yeah, it's um, sometimes you get annoyed at, at some of the stuff that you see that um, that wasn't done properly. You just think that's a, that's a schoolboy error. No one should be screwing up over something like that. And then I remember the game that I screwed up. That was really simple. I'm like, yeah, I'll shut up, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Uh, I mean, I, I love yeah. the conversation and I'm sure everybody does as well. But uh, we sort of promised them uh, a bit more code on the screen here. Right, okay then. So let's um, let's uh, get... Uh... Have you got... You haven't got a dialogue box over the action replay there, have you? I don't have no. It's it, now. It's just blue, and there is a, a cursor right, blinking. Lovely. Right. So, obviously, we need to uh, crack the copy lock. So, um, we know when the copy lock happens, um, but what we need to do is we now need to investigate what the copy lock does. We know whereabouts it is in memory. So, what we can do is this. Right. Right. So, how I intend to do this is it's what's known as a diff crack, a difference crack. So I'm going to take a snapshot of memory just before the copy lock gets called and store it in extra memory. I'm then going to let the copy lock run and do its thing. And then once the copy lock has done its thing, excuse me, I'm then going to compare the two memories, the before and after. And if I've got my calculations right, then there will be subtle differences in the code that's had the copy lock run on it versus the code that hasn't had the copy lock code run on it. And then we can manually put that in ourselves and see if we can defeat the copy lock. But the first thing we've got to do is we've got to knock out uh, the Bitmap Brothers extra memory routines because the way that this game works is if it detects extra memory, it loads the game into memory Mm -hmm. All in one go, does a copy lock check, and then you can play the game with no more disk access. And obviously, it's copying it all from RAM. It's much faster loading. We need to fool the game into thinking that it's got 512k only, because we need somewhere to put the um, the pre-copy locked code into memory so that we can compare them. Um, we could save it to disk. And then reset the Amiga, uh, but that's a lot of farting around and relying on Amiga discs, and we're not doing that today. So, um, right, let's see what we're going to do. I'll look at the book first. 
So I'm disassembling the boot block and I'm looking at the boot block. And straight away at address 844C, I can see that it wants to stick 100,000 into address 28. 100,000 is basically um, one meg on a chip RAM machine. So on the Amiga, 0 to 80,000 is 512k of chip. And then 80,000 to 100,000 is the other 512k and so on. Um, this Amiga emulation that we've got is uh, using slow RAM. So let's have a look. This is just all, this is all basic code using the Amiga system uh, track disk device to load sectors into memory. There's nothing exciting about any of this at all. Um, that's just the text in the boot block. The boot block is from 8400 to 8800 there. In fact, if I uh, get that off the screen, that's the boot block there. Yep. All of it. But the only code is from 8400 to 8520, something like that. So if I get rid of that, get rid of that. So basically, all of that there at the top there is the code that actually will load the first part of um, Speedball 2. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to reset the machine. And we break in. And it was put in stuff at address 28. Yes, it was. Right. So that's telling it where the end of extra RAM is, I think. Let's just check to see if there's anything else in there. It must be something to do with... Was that all of it? Right, let's see if that's... Um, we can speed the loading up. This is great, you doing stuff on emulation. It really is. I do agree. I'm just going to quickly see if we've knocked out the um, extra memory routine. it knocked out so if we look at um yeah that's all um uh oh, what should i was what would i describe that as that's all system stuff at the bottom of memory that's hit tables and stuff like that but speedball 2 hasn't used that extra memory that's just stuff from the system that's not speedball 2 otherwise it'd be stuff here So now we know that... Um, and C here is somewhere far up in memory, which is where the uh, the fast mem is, is situated. It's down to, it's down to how uh, the Amiga maps stuff. So this is known as slow memory. This is yeah. the stuff that sits in the trap door. Um, so obviously a normal A500, 1.2, 1.3, has got memory from 0 to 80,000. That's your 512k of chip RAM. And then... Uh, the stuff that goes in the trap door, it's cheaper RAM. It's not classed as real fast RAM um, because it, I think it only gives something like a 2% speed increase if you've got code running exclusively out of the slow RAM. Whereas on the A1200 with real fast RAM, it's in fact, if you've code running from fast RAM, it, it's almost running twice the speed as it would do in chip RAM, because there's no conflict with the custom chips. Mm. This is RAM um, at C00000, which the custom chips, the Blitter, 
um, Agnes, Denise, Paula, all of those chips cannot have access to. It's solely for the processor. Um, so uh, I think it's to do with DNA and what have you. It, it just means that processor code runs faster because it's not having to share that memory with the custom chips. Um, but it's perfect for running code in, or it's perfect for just storing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a it was a cheap way of expanding your Amiga back in the in the eighties and nineties. I think my RAM expansion cost like thirty five pounds, um, and it just gave it a whole new lease of life. Um, and obviously, from a cracking point of view, having extra RAM was always useful mm -hmm. because if you had like a complicated disk system, um, and if it was like lots of code files everywhere with loaders everywhere. Well, it was always useful to have that game running from RAM. And that way, if you ever missed a check, like a loader somewhere, well, then if a floppy drive went off, well, you knew that that was something that you'd missed because so far you'd already redirected floppy accesses to go to the extra RAM to get the code from there. So obviously it's just faster to load from RAM when you're playtesting something than it is for it to load off floppy because uh, it's the ridiculous things that you had to do because speed literally was of the essence once once the modem scene took off mm. and more people could afford modems and the phone bills that went with it um but that's when the the, the speed just got absolutely ridiculous i mean for the modem scene and that i'd imagine quite a lot of crackers were did physically have the discs in their hand to crack from because they had all the time in the well, I wouldn't say they had all the time in the world, but everything was being passed around by mail back mm. in those days. Mm. Um, so you had a bit more time, but as with anything, once a group of people discover a faster way of doing stuff, mm. you know, perhaps they'd go to a shop to get the originals. Well, who supplies the shop? Well, these distributors do, so we'll go and get it from there. Who supplies them? Oh, well, these big distributors supply them, so we'll go and get the games off them. Now, all of a sudden, everything is a race. Mm -hmm. So we now know that we can knock out extra memory. So let's just reset that again. We break it in with the action replay. And we're, again, we're going to knock out the Bitmap Brothers. Are you triggering that by pressing the button? Or do you? Uh, do, was there a freeze point or something? Well, no, no, I just press the action replay button to oh. act activate the action. It, it automatically turns the drive off. Yeah. There's no damage to floppy disks or any of that nonsense. Yeah. But if, you, if, 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 I'll tell you what, if I reset that and I'll show you, because I've already seen the code in the boot block that does this, but if I... So I press the action replay button. If I do exceptions, this will give me a list of the exception table from zero to... Or up to 80, I think it is. Mm. Right. If you look at all those, you've got bus error, address error, illegal instruction, division by zero. These are all the the, um, the addresses in the in ROM. So FC0818 at the top there, that's an address in ROM. So if a bus error was to happen, it would go through the exception at address 8, and it would call the code at FCO 818. But if you look at that list there, you'll see that one of them is completely different to the others. Line A is pointing yeah. somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. It's pointing to a, a memory address in slow RAM. And what that is, is that's telling the game, oh, the end of extra memory um, is this address. So use that. Obviously, if it was a chip RAM machine, it would be... Let's see if I can do a bit of maths here. 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 7, 4, 6, D, O. That number, instead of C, 7, 4, 6, D, 0, would be F, 4, 6, D, 0, which is obviously below 100,000 in hex, which still keeps it within the 1 meg range. And it would just work out the where it needs to load files based on that number there. Um, so we know that that's abnormal. And, and I've seen it set up in the boot block. So I go to address 28. I zero it out. And now if I list exceptions, you'll now see that line A is zero. So I'm assuming that 
the bitmap brothers um if there's no memory if there's no memory at, uh, at that extra memory address it's going to set that to zero itself um and it just in the game code it just tests that memory address and if there's something in there it knows that it extra ram's present and it will it will load stuff into there well obviously we don't want it to do that so we've cleared that and we're going to carry on let it load in Usually, extra replay is good. It will, um, you can enter and exit virtually anything. There's a few Anko games that he doesn't like going into. We break in with the action replay. Was it 1506C? Yeah. Right, so that's the start of the copy lock there. Now, we're not going to modify that copy lock because we want that code untouched. So Before we and to, after. We need to find the code that calls the copy lock. And obviously, that's the memory address. So we do FA1506C and just hit return. I'm going to speed it up. Dun, dun, dun. It's There's lots of different ways that um, a, a, a call to a memory address can be disguised. So if this doesn't work, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. But it's still quite cute that emulating a 7 megahertz machine takes uh, most of the CPU of a gigahertz machine. Yeah, well, I've put it on, I've put the, the Winnie on, on turbo mode to search through. Mm. Let's see, it's searching through the. The one mega memory, I might set that to just search in the 512k. Right, so it hasn't found it. Right, well, there's there's more than one way to find that memory address because that memory address will only be found if it's um, in a piece of code. So, for instance, if I was to do a similar piece of code like this, uh, LEA 1506C into A0. Right, so if I do a search for that, that address now, FA1506C. And there we go. It finds it straight away. Mm. Because it's it's basically it's searching in code mode. It's searching for that number in code mode. But if I was to change that to oh. If I changed it to that, and then try to search for it, it can't find it because it's it's basically the way that it's addressing yeah. is why yeah. it can't find it. But there's another way, so we do this. Just a byte pattern. Yeah, basically. Oh, it's found it. Gotcha. And then, and then we can look at it through the monitor. And there's the number. Mm. So track two. Ah, that looks like a piece of code to me. And there we go. So there's that's a simple way for them to disguise a call to a copy lock. Now yep. obviously they could be they could do other things like they could locate um one five zero 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 into A zero and then JSR six C onto A zero basically an offset of A0, so mm. that uh, in the code it's not directly referenced, so you won't find it. Um, but I don't think... Um... Oh. oh dear, what's that? We found it in the exceptions. They seem to have a habit of this game. And if we look at line F in the exceptions... You can see that they've changed all the exceptions, obviously, because they don't want Kickstart to handle any exceptions. They want to handle them themselves. Obviously, when they're debugging the game and that, if there's any crashes, it would go through these exceptions and they want to handle them themselves. It might be one that they can fix on the fly and carry on playtesting. Yep. Or 
It's Most of them are the same, so it's 40 yeah. and F8. Yeah, so there's, 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 none of those are saving anything. That is basically the Amiga is probably going to hang, but it could be a it could be a um, a legacy thing from whatever development system that they were using. That they go back into this code, it triggers something, which then stops the development machine and tell, tells them exactly where the problem was, so that they can fix it. But line F, quite clearly, that number in there is for the copy lock. So now we need to find out what puts that value into 2C because it's important, it's, it's very important that we have access to the code up to the instruction before it executes the copy lock. Because otherwise, if we just do it at any old random place, there could be loads of other values changed in memory mm. and then we're going to have to write a whole list of values into memory because we're like, well, I don't know if that was anything to do with the copy lock. So, I so mean, if I understand it here, you would like the execution to stop on the instruction before it calls 1506C and then, and then you store a copy into your slow fast mem and then you do uh, the execution of the copy lock and then you do a compare between uh, what you have in RAM and what you have in the exactly. stored memory. Exactly. So obviously it's very important for us to capture capture yeah. memory just before the copy lock gets called. That way we can be assured that everything in memory that's been changed is because of the copy lock and we're and not what a load of false positives down. And there is no like set freeze point to 1506C. You need well, to. We're going we're to find out. I mean, it, it, there's got to be code that's put that written that to that address. Oh. You just need to find it now. So my first thing would to do would be to look for see if anything's writing to address 2C. Oh, what's this? And it has something in A0. It's so found, it's... it's found something. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's it. No. No, it's not that. That's moving 8518 into A0 into 2C, so it's not that. It might take a little while to find it because obviously what they intending to do by sticking it in the line line F exception is they're going to cause a line F exception so that it will then go to the exception handler and trigger the the code that tells it to go to the copy lock. Mm. Right, so there's nothing there's nothing there. So what well, another way we can cheat on this Right, so what I've done there. I, I, I have no idea about uh, the Amiga, but I'm guessing you are now storing a color in a color register and then you're jumping back. So uh, exactly. with an eternal loop here. Yeah, so basically I'm storing green in color register zero and then branching back to it. So when it tries to call the copy lock, oh. the screen will go green in some manner and it will stop. Okay, so, so the C64 way of doing this would be ink DO20, which means increase the color and then you uh, jump back on. So you have a flickering, a flickering of the, uh, the background color. Just for you. Yeah. <laughs> Just for you. You want, you want flickering color, you want copper bars, you've got them. You've got the whole rainbow here. <laughs> right, so we'll, <laughs> we'll let that boot. <laughs> You're going to be a very happy guy. <laughs> oh, man. There we go. One second. It's, um, it's deciding it's not recognizing the fire button. Will do. 
I don't hear you when it's playing too loud, but... Uh... Yeah, we're really good. Thanks, Is that, is that enough colors for you? That's perfect, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> Only a music that makes it possible. <laughs> Do you know where it's called from now? No. Okay. Right, so we're at the copy lock. Um, it's obviously called our exception. Um, and what we need to do is go back through the um, stack to see what it was that called it. And there's an address there, 836A. The first did the first number is to do with um the current status register mm. before it was called. And 836A. So if we look at 836A, oh line F. Look at that. Mm. So that is undoubtedly what called it yeah. is 836A, where it's got the line F. Yeah, just basically trying to disguise. Um, so I'm going to drop that down. 836A equals line F. Is that yeah, pull, yeah. pulling line F, or what is... Is that a mnemonic? It looks like, weird. Well, basically, line F is basically saying um, line F exception. Um, I think... I think line F is... I can't remember if it's to do with FPU or certain peripheral devices where you would go into the line F exception handler and it would process that extra stuff for you. Um I, I've 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 never seen it used on the Amiga for anything other than people being sneaky, oh. like encryption and what have you, and having the code dive off all in different places to try and confuse the would-be cracker. Um, I I think it's actually got a specific use on sixty-eight thousand. I can't know if it's to do with peripherals or something. Um, it's so basically, it you can handle hardware where you can emulate it in software or something i'm not altogether sure but for sneaky people that want to um you know piss you about they'll, they'll do this yep right so we we now know that uh that's the that's the code that calls the copy lock there's nothing else there no right so we know that so we're going to reset the amiga again When I go to address 28, we're going to knock out the extra RAM routine. And we're going to let it go. We could have just sped that up. Right, so now we're going to go to address 836A. Eh? Oh, what's going on here? Ah. It hasn't That's loaded yet, or is there something uh, else? Uh, right, clever. Right. So what they've done is they've um they've they've basically changed this to hide the fact that it's a line F. F A eight three six A. Let's see if there's anything put into eight three six A certainly it must be surely. Yep, yeah, there we go. That's pretty uh. rubbish. Right, yeah, so what they're doing here is whatever's in um, D1, they're going to bit set it against A36A, which is going to modify the address 836A into a line F. So basically self-modified code. Mm -hmm. So what we'd need to do, so 84BA equals SMC. So we're going to let that do what it wants to do. But what I'm going to do
I'm going to break point on that. Going to speed that up. Right, so it's now break pointed on that. So just before it gets to modify it, there it is still there unmodified. So if I take that breakpoint off and breakpoint on the next instruction, which is to do with D1, mm -hmm. and then let it bit set on 836A. I must do it more than once because that's not a line F yet. All oh, right, I see. Right. So it's doing it in a little loop. Mm -hmm. So we'll break on to 8464. If you notice there, 884B2. Eight, yeah, it's going to it's going to, keep, it's going to keep on going in the loop until eventually adding up until you have the branch not say it's triggering. Like that. Yeah. So we know that eight three six A calls the copy lock. So we're sticking a breakpoint on that, and we're going to let it carry on loading. Right. This is just before we look at exceptions. 1506C. We know the copy lock's there. Right, so trans zero to this is transferring memory from address zero to eighty thousand, i.e. the top of chip memory, and copying it all to slow RAM. And it's done. So if I look at you see there's the copy lock code there at the correct offset. And so we now know that um, what we are going to do is there is going to be one modification that we're going to make is sometimes action replay can affect copy lock mm -hmm. with breakpoints. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's to do the way that, um, that copy lock works is it physically slows the machine down very slightly the problem is copy lock works by timing how long it takes to read the track so if the speed of the machine is ever so slightly affected it can affect the results that the copy lock will do mm. and we don't want that so what i've done is there's the line f at 836a and i've now modified the code afterwards to an infinite branch to itself Yep. Because we know that once it gets to this point, the copy lock's done everything it needs to do. Yep. So no break points. And then we just let the, the copy lock do its business. And if you notice, it stopped. And it stopped at the address. Yep. Now, if I could remember what the bloody hell that was, I could have just put that back in so it doesn't get picked up as a false positive. But I'm not worried about that because... If we can't remember that we've done that, we need shooting, frankly. But anyway, what we need to do now is we now do need to do ourselves a simple routine, and it, and it really is a simple routine. Um, we just decide how low in memory we go, how, how low in memory we're checking. Sonic will check from zero, uh, and we'll go up to 7th. Right, there's nothing at 7F. So we're not corrupting anything there, and it's quite simple. So now I'm going to do a quick compare routine. So it's going to be... A0 is going to have 0, which is the code that's now had the copy lock run through it. A1's pointing into the, the, the code that hasn't been copy locked. Mm -hmm.
Right, it's a simple routine. It's basic, bully basic. So, copy locked code in A0, where the copy lock's been run. The copy of the code before the copy lock was run is now in A1. And then we're moving a byte from memory into D0. Mm. And then we're comparing that byte with the byte that's the exact same memory location offset in the other memory. Yep. Check to see if it's because obviously we can't make any we can't make any assumptions. We can't make any assumptions whether or not it's only modifying bytes or words on long words. But with bytes, we capture every single change. It's longer and more laborious, but realistically, how much code can it possibly um change? Not a huge amount. So anyway, and then it's got a B and E. If the um if the bytes don't match, paint the screen green and get stuck in a, an endless loop. If they do match, add one to A0. Add, oh, I've got that all wrong. Oh, yeah, of course. You need to both source and, and destination. Increment, you basically increment them like a counter yeah. so that you can then check the next byte, and then you just branch back to moving the bytes back in the data, data register to see if, whether or not you can spot any differences. There's, there is nothing special about this code. It's not optimized. I know all the, the elite coders there are looking at it going, oh, you could shave 20 bytes off that. Oh, who cares? It works. I don't care. Yeah. But is, so, isn't there like a compare function in the action replay here? Uh, I, I'm not interested in using the action replay for that because I don't know whether or not it compares bytes, words, or long words. And I don't want to miss anything out. Okay. It is, is you can write the code yourself in memory and you can jump to the code without having left the action replay and knowing it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Now, a sensible person would save that extra memory so that they don't have to do this bollocks again. But uh, as long as we get it right first time, yeah. we won't have to worry. Um, but this would find only the first instance, right? Say that again. You would you would only trip for the first instance, and then you would go into the eternal loop, and then you would need to go back yeah, into yeah, this. Obviously, what you would do is once it trips up over a change byte, yeah. you would then just jump to 7F010 to let it carry on until it comes to the next byte that's different. Okay. Um, so that way, you don't miss anything. Um, I mean, some people say, well, that's a slow. It's, it's not about slow. It's about precise. Yeah. I have no idea what the copy lock's modified, so I, I make no assumptions. That's how you, you release a duff crack. Um, super, super. So basically, now that we've done that, we go into 7F. In fact, if I stick a, a breakpoint on that. Right. Uh, it's found, if you look at the where I've done registers, you can see A0 at the bottom left-hand corner. And next to it is A1. And they've both got address 9. They're saying there's something yep. different about address 9. Zero. Uh, I don't think I'm worried about that. That just looks like a, an exception thing. Let's have a look at that. Uh, it's one of the exceptions has changed to zero. No, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about that. Obviously, it's, there's a series of four bytes there that have changed from an address to zero, so we've got to skip through all of them. Yeah, it's still the same little area down very yeah. bottom of the memory. All right, now we've left to 26. What's at 26? That was the same. Uh... No, if it's BB72. So uh, that's, I know what that'll be. That's possibly to do, yeah, that's to do with, if you look, if you look at exceptions, and we look at number 24, 
Can you see what that is? Trace One. exception. Yeah. And that's to do with the copy lock. That's how it does its um, uh, decryption, process the instruction, re-encrypt, decrypt the next one, et cetera, and step in and step in and step in. So we don't need to worry about that. That's just a side effect of the copy lock um, running, but that in itself is not important. So... Oh, now we're up to EA. There's definitely something different there. Mm. I don't know whether or not that's important or not, but bearing in mind that Bitmap Brothers code is down this low in certain places, or has been, it's quite possible that there's something there that we might need to emulate. And what do you normally do? Are, are you scribbling this down or writing oh, this somewhere? I will be. I'm going to be scribbling this down because I don't fancy going through all this again. So, EA equals F nine one E zero seven B D. Yeah. We might not need that one. But I'm always suspicious of great big long numbers in copy locks. You gotta do this four times. Yeah, because you trigger all the four bytes that yeah, you just cool. uh, scribble we, no, down. No. Oh right now we're Oh now that's we're a big jump. Code here. Oh look at that. Twenty five pieces. On the on the right hand side here, where it says half time. Yeah. And now look at the line below. Ah, Lulf time. Yeah, yeah. It's modified that text there. So it's fixed. So it's fixed a text thing. So this is obviously how the Bitmap brothers know that they can check to see whether it's being cracked. Because if it tries to display the word half time on screen and it's bollocks, they're like, well, they haven't removed the checks properly. Yeah. So we've got 25D6. And it's o three o three forty eight forty one. And what this tells me is that the copy lock is modifying long words because that whole long word there is changed, mm. but the next long word hasn't. So it's not doing it on byte boundaries. It could be doing it on word boundaries, I suppose. But it's I suspect that it's doing it's doing long word, but. I'd rather keep going as I'm going because yeah. it works and it picks up every difference. So now you need to do this four times because again, it tripped on all four of them now. Yeah, exactly. Do you see the bit of a delay there? Yeah. It's obviously because it's much higher. Here we go. Now this is the one that I think that we did. I say we. Yeah. So that's the branch that I put in there. So we yeah. know we can get that. Because that was so that we could capture the, the copy lot before it ran. And that would be a few of them as well. Another four. Well, no, it wasn't four. It was only two because it was only a word. Four E75 is an RTS. That's a, that's a physical instruction. So if I look at D... CC8 RTS. If I look at 0D CC8, it's bollocks. So, another long word. So, it's setting an RTS so that it will not continue executing whatever is after that, but if it's faulty, it will execute whatever that is. Exactly. It will run into the code behind it, and obviously, it's designed that it will crash. Or cause problems. Yeah. All right, go so if I want to. Here we go, another one. Eleven. 
That's that also is, an RTS, right? It's a, a no-op and an RTS. Every cracker knows what a no-op is on the Amiga. It's your favorite instruction. <laughs> uh, it's, it's EA on the 64. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> so as you can see, it's changed those two words, 4E71, 4E75. Originally, it was D59C8551. So, you know, when you've got code like this appearing, it was, so this was... One one zero zero six, and it's four e seven one four e seven five. Yeah, oh, you could just get away with just putting four e seven five in there. In all honesty, but it all depends what the code is underneath that it uh, that it fixes. Right, so yeah, four again. Oh, another one. I don't know whether or not that is a valid change, but it is a change. So it's it's more likely to be correct in the change yeah, format it's, than it's, in, rather, in the original format. I'd rather I'd rather change it than not change it because it's changed for a reason. One seven three. B C equals zero seven E three. It could be unconnected, but uh look a bit of a knob if uh, it was needed. I think this might be the copy lock. Is it copy lock or is it the stack? Does the stack go back that far? I think 1B was uh, one of the exceptions. If you look at the exceptions list again, I think uh, 1BAA is something. 1BB72 is a trace exception, which is copy lock, which isn't quite up there, but the copy lock, it, well, the copy lock's not that big, but we are quite close to the stack area. If you look at the far right hand side at the bottom where it says, 1BC3A, that's the stack area. Yeah. Uh, 1B, 1B, 1BC3A. Right, and then we go backwards. And what did we say it was? 1BAA3. Yeah, that's the stack area. Right, we're going to find a million changes now. Okay, because all the subroutine calls are. Yeah, there's there's no way that there's any more in there, and there's if we. This is all going to be graphics and stuff after the stack. I mean, we can check to see where the, the screen is. Where is that? That's it. 5FBAA. So that's the screen there. Might be double but double buffered though. Let's see if there's another one there. There's all the bit planes there for it. Right, so what we're going to do now is so that we can show the people at home that we know what we're doing. It's going to create a disk. Uh, disk, 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 floppy drives. Now we just see the like top or the, the, the left side. Disk. Save. <clears throat> Right, so we're going to put all right. So speedball is in the drive, and then what we're going to do is we're going to copy speedball. We're going to speed it up because life's too short. <laughs> God, I wish we'd had this back in the day. I really do. <laughs> do well, you, know? you could buy it. It was called an Amiga Three Thousand. 
Uh, oh yeah, yeah, because <laughs> I had loads of money for stuff like that. If I had an Amiga three thousand by now, I, I could uh, I could go and get a house with it. Oh. Right, so we've got that. That's now copied into memory. And then we got a speedball crack disk, and we click on OK. What does it say? Insert target disk and push right mouse button. Okay. I'm not waiting all day for that, are we? <laughs> Obviously, it's important that we show that the viewers at home um, what happens when Speedball 2 fails. Copy finished. Yes. So now we can reset. We've copied the disk. The copy lock went to being copied. I'm just going to interrupt it. Get rid of the extra memory. Speedball loading up. And it will load to the point where it's and checked gonna, and then gonna, it fails for it. And we're going to let the copy lock do its business without interfering with it. And it's obviously not going to work because obviously there's no copy lock track in this. Yeah. And we'll let it load. It should probably sound a bit more ridiculous now as well. As there's no check lock, no disk uh, check Yeah, it took longer because it's just not there. Oh, one player game, knockout. Can't wait to play this game. Buy all that. It's crashed. You git. How dare you protect your software from the likes of me? Right. So we're going to reset that. No. Yep. I'm breaking again. Look out the extra memory routine. Oh, now we're going to break in. Right, so... Right, so we go for the, the routine that modifies that address into line F. The one that incremented it by one and then had a branch up until yeah. some condition was met, and we skipped that. See, Cracker's best friend, no ops. He can't modify that routine ever again. So, so we go back to 836A, which is that one there. They can't even call a copy lock anymore. How mean is that? But we are going to call the copy lock. Right, so we'll do this by hand. And now you're going to poke all those values in. Yep.
So there's the values there that we poked in. So th if that can... this is now your uh, <laughs> copy lock at... emulation. Say again. It's your copy lock emulation here. You are emulating the result of what the copy lock routine would yield yeah. if Without it successfully did its thing. Yeah. So if you look at two five d six, you see you've got half time yep. mod modeled up. Yep. And we've got the code up there that will fix that. Yep. O three o three four eight four one. Yeah. Four e seven five d three five zero. Yeah. Four e seven one four e seven five. Yeah. Uh, yep, and yep, and so we'll break away from that. So now we put a direct call to the copy lock. Now, the reason why we put a direct call to the copy lock is it was originally being called by an exception, which means we'd have to return with an RTE. Mm. Um, we've now removed the need for that. Yep. So, what we're going to do now is get rid of any breakpoints. And then we'll let this do this thing. And you'll notice that the, the copy lock noise is missing. Mm. Hopefully, unless I balls it up. Crash the <laughs> <laughs> Oops. What? Was that supposed to end like that? Yes, it was. This is a cliffhanger for you to uh, ensure that you will stay on and watch the episode number two. Because in episode number two, you would see when Phil has fixed the issue and what that looks like. I would summarize all the steps that I was taken because that might be a bit tricky to kind of pick up from just watching the entire thing here and then there will be um, a section where Phil is also describing how he has done things if he uh, did not have access to the original because this method that you've seen today is sort of assuming access to the real original but how can we make sure that you don't miss episode number two. Yes, this is where the very nice and fancy features subscribe and that little bell button comes in really handy. So do ensure that you subscribe and do ensure that you have this little bell button also ticked so you will get a notification when the next episode is up. So see you in a week.